And right now we will have a panel discussion on mixed precision optimization. And I will be uh, the moderator. I'm an ask uh, postdoc uh, at, here at LBL. Um, yeah. So our three panelists for today's sessions are Pierre Sherry Lee from LBNL, CJ Newburn from NVIDIA, and CJ Rubio Gonzalez from UC Davis. Sherry Lee is a senior scientist in the computational research division from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Dr. Lee has worked on diverse problems in high performance scientific computations, including parallel computing, sparse matrix computations, high precision arithmetic, and combinatorial scientific computing. She's the lead developer of SuperLU, a widely used sparse direct solver, and has contributed to the development of several other mathematical libraries, including RPREC, LAPAC, PDSLIN, StreamPack, and XBLAS. She has collaborated with many domain scientists to deploy the advanced mathematical software in their application codes. So now, um, Sherry will talk about exploiting mixed precision in sparse direct solver. Sherry, is, is, okay. can share your slides. Okay. So let's see. I'm having trouble to... I didn't know I, I'm the first, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so let's see whether you can see. You see the slides? Yeah, we can. Okay, very good, yeah. Thank can you. you. Can you yeah. start the, um, the slideshow? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I can turn on my video. Oh, what happened? Okay. Uh, thank you, Hugo, for the uh, kind introduction. And as uh, Hugo mentioned, uh, I was uh, actually working quite a bit in the past on the high precision arithmetic. Now we're coming, <laughs> need to do low precision, as low as possible. So that's interesting. So we, we uh, by the way, we do have a quite a few uh, high precision libraries. Um, actually, every year we got uh, still get uh, more than a thousand downloads of those libraries. So it's uh, depending on your application, the precision need are certainly different. Okay, so I will uh, talk about uh, the uh, our recent uh, effort of trying to use lower precision, lower uh, precision in sparse direct solvers. And uh, the goal here is to determine, you know, where, how low precision you can use. And uh, obviously we want to be safe. You know, you want to, in the end, get correct result. And another thing is uh, we always want to analyze the accuracy of the numerical algorithms with uh, mixed or lower precision. <laughs> so, so you want to tell the users that uh, what guarantee you have with this algorithm. So this. Uh, these two goals go hand in hand. And uh, you probably uh, already know this uh, um, about iterative refinement in the dense uh, matrix uh, format uh, context. So, so the LU-based direct solvers uh, can uh, safely use the mixed precision. And if you do properly, you can get a <laughs> desired uh, accuracy. And the, uh, the good helper uh, library, the function is uh, iterative refinement. So in the um, example code here, I'm showing you the methodology here is so you do the expensive one using lower precision, but uh, for the cheap operations, so you do lower precision. Uh, you uh, use higher precision to recover the uh, accuracy lost from lower precision. <laughs> So for example, in the dense LU case, the factorization is expensive, it's order n cube. So you want to do maybe single precision. But then this uh, IR iteration is uh, you compute the residual after your first uh, solution and uh, solve this correction term and add back this uh, correction term to your final solution that you can probably iterate a few times. So in this uh, IR loop, you can see that uh, 
this uh, matrix vector multiplication is cheap. You can do double precision. And uh, triangular solve is not so cheap. It's but still cheaper than the factorization you can do a single precision. And the uh, double precision here, the addition is very cheap relative to the others. So look at uh, this uh, column. You can see in the dense case, you have most expensive and is n cube. All the rest, the next expensive ones are n cube, uh, n square. So that uh, you have a lot of room to do the cheap operation many times before catching up to n cube. But in the sparse case, uh, the situation is slightly different. So in this case, uh, for the standard 3D problem, for if you do the sparse LU, we get uh, n square complexity. And then the uh, residual calculation is cheap. But the triangular solve is uh, actually not so cheap. It's n to the four third. So that uh, you can see the, the gap between expensive, between the uh, most expensive and the cheap one is relatively small compared to the dense case. Oops. So here I will just show you the ratio. In the dense case, expensive versus cheap is order n, so you have a lot of room to play. And in the sparse case, the expensive versus cheap is order n to the two thirds, so you have less room to play, less room to you know to do this iterative refinement. If you need many iterations, it will catch up very quickly. And numerically, this algorithm is well understood. We have already implemented this in dense LA pack. And uh, also in the uh, uh, apply this for the overdetermined least square problems, and these were published a while ago. And recently, uh, some researchers they use even better technique in terms of uh, iterative refinement here. Instead of doing the pure this uh, simple iterative refinement, you can do like a GM rest for this uh, loop. It's still much faster in the dense case. So all these were illustrated in the dense case. So now moving to the sparse case, uh, the first uh, issue I mentioned is uh, the gap, you know, the, between the expensive and cheap is relatively small. So you don't have too much room to play for that. And another issue is uh, in the sparse case, so you need to do gather scatter operation, which get in the way compared to the uh, dense case. So this is the example of, for, for example, in the super LU direct solver, you want to factorize this matrix A into L and U. And all the shaded block here, they are uh, non-zero, but all the blank ones, these are zeros. So you don't, you don't store those zeros. You don't uh, do the operations with those zeros, et cetera. And then here, this picture shows it's mapped to six processes, 6 MPI, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is a block uh, cyclic uh, kind of uh, mapping. <laughs> and uh, in the GPU implementation for this code, our strategy is to use the GPU, this side, as the uh, offload mode. So the panel factorization is uh, still on CPU. And depending on the GPU memory size, if it's uh, not uh, big enough, we will keep a part of the short complement also on CPU. So it's a splitting between CPU, GPU. And this uh, splitting location is uh, a parameter depending on how large memory you have. And nowadays, uh, GPU memory is pretty big, so we can do a, a lot of uh, stuff on GPU. So that's uh, really good news. But in the early days, like uh, five years ago, uh, this part of the GPU memory, only like a one gig, uh, two gig, so it's uh, pretty limited. So the main thing uh, I want to mention here, if you look at the computational kernel, every step in the sparse case, you have to gather the sparse blocks into a dense work array, and then use this uh, dense work array to perform GEMM. After that, you scatter this dense work array into the remaining sparse blocks. So this step one and three, you don't do in the dense case. But in the sparse case, you have to do this. And to use a, a tensor course, for example, it's actually relatively easy. It's not so difficult. So for example, for 
to do the single precision GMM, what, all we need to do in the code is to set a cool blast uh, set math mode to be this, and then you do the cool blast uh, as GMM. Then you set math set the mode back to normal mode after this uh, operation. So we see a little bit benefit of using this, but the main problem for the sparse case is uh, the GMM operation take the fraction of the time is relatively small compared to the whole calculation, and you have something getting in the way. Um, sorry, Sherry, it's uh, more than seven minutes. Can you wind up in 30 seconds? Oh, okay, so I, I'll stop, pretty much stop here. So I, I'll just uh, show you some uh, results. For example, on the uh, Summit machine, currently we're using six MPI, six uh, GPU. Each MPI drives one GPU. So I have two sparse matrices. So they are on the order of a million dimension. And then you can see that uh, the uh, factorization time double versus uh, single precision, you get something like uh, 48 or 50% faster just by moving less data, you know, doing the single precision, doing less uh, communication in terms of uh, bandwidth. And as I mentioned, gather, gather scatter actually will take 42% uh, in this case, in this case, 35%. Uh, so you only have uh, like uh, 50, 60% of the time that you can you know, do that fraction, you can speed up by single precision, you know, tensor core, those kind of thing. But this uh, gather scatter will, you know, cannot benefit. And the solve is relatively fast. So you can, you have room to do quite a few iterations, uh, iterative refinement to catch up this double precision. So there's a benefit there. So I'll stop here. Sorry about this. Thank you, Sherry, for sharing this uh, nice uh, results and uh, so all to do with the iterator refinements. Um, uh, I'm just uh, talking to the audience to say that uh, you can ask your questions during the talk and uh, the panelists will answer when all of them have uh, presented. So right now um, we have uh, Chris J. Newburn. CJ is a principal architect and drives HPC strategies and the software product roadmap in NVIDIA Compute Software with a special focus on systems and programming models for scale. Dr. Newburn is a community builder with a passion for extending the core capabilities of hardware and software platforms from HPC into AI, data science, and visualization. He is delighted to have worked on volume products that his mom used and that helped researchers do science that previously wasn't possible. So now CJ for talking about the mixed precision tuning work group, working group. Yeah. Uh, CJ, we can't hear you. Better when I'm not you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm really delighted to have worked with Hugo and uh, many others uh, in a working group on the topic of reduced precision. Um, the key thing here is that uh, it's, it's one thing to have cool hardware um, and ideas about what you could do in hardware, but what really matters is doing new science, is making end-to-end -end connections and working with people who have the use cases who are actually uh, in the trenches doing the work like all of you, um, trying to figure out how to apply it and getting a dialogue going back and forth between end-user developers and our developers as to how we can do that. So uh, we created a working group on this topic and uh, kind of first one I'll talk about, uh, Sherry, thanks for already talking about sort of the algorithmic complexity part. Um, another factor of this is really understanding where you can apply reduced precision. So uh, we decided that we would offer uh, many different options uh, in the, our GPU hardware for supporting FP16, FP32 um, and FP64, um, and I'll talk about uh, some of the other uh, variants in this we have. But really understanding uh, sort of the better first order, where do you need precision and where do you need range? Uh, looking at accumulators uh, tend to want higher precision, uh, more so than things like EXP um, that others have experimented with tools on. Uh, if you find that your range is too broad, uh, you can do some preconditioning, for example, for linear systems. You may be able to rescale to fit into the range uh, where possible, and uh, you can test the tolerance with uh, introduced noise uh, in that space as well. Um, 
And uh, so one of the things that uh, people like John Stone have tried out is using fixed point uh, for reproducibility. Here it's, it's easier actually if you uh, don't have to worry about all the cases that have to be excluded, things are reversible, it can be easier for algorithm development and there are a number of opportunities there. Um, we've also looked at some different algorithmic optimizations like minimizing the number of transpositions and even reusing previous preconditioners just to be reducing the amount of work that's involved. <coughs> um, people have tossed out some ideas like tuning the encodings for graphics APIs. Um, people have thought about uh, sort of what do you need to uh, take advantage of hardware that can do a matrix multiply or write in hardware rather than just doing individual vector operations like we call them tensor cores. Um, you may need the right shape. Um, we have opportunities where uh, you can eliminate sort of uh, half of the entries that are coming in if they're zero um, and mux those for as much as a 2x performance on the latest GPU, the A100 hardware that we have. Um, and we looked at things with um, int1 and int8 for signal processing and so on. So um, there are lots of opportunities here. And you can see at the right, uh, for teraflops, um, we've gotten the best performance where we use a, an FPC, FP16 tensor core um, that accumulates in uh, 32 bits. If you didn't accumulate in 32 bits, um, then uh, you may never even converge, but it, it, at larger problem sizes, uh, it, things tend to fall off. So uh, what is it that uh, we can do in this space? So one of the key things that, um, you know, I kind of started with this, and actually I know many of you in the Berkeley community because I helped start the Xbug effort uh, back when I was at Intel. Um, and this is kind of, uh, of a similar vein of gathering together people that are passionate experts and share what works, uh, show how much it helps, uh, be able to share uh, reproducing results, um, try it and then give get feedback through a community discussion and be inspired by a range of different applications. You saw a number of different applications and their speed ups listed on the previous slide and maybe document some of the rules of thumb that works. So um, I'd like to invite you, uh, we've had uh, a monthly session for um, uh, I think it's well over a year now um, and we'd like to invite anybody who's interested to join in that um, and kind of Take your turn in taking a half hour or longer to present some of the work that you've been doing uh, and, and uh, work through that. Our next uh, session for that is next Tuesday. Um, we'll be talking about a particular interface we have called Cosless uh, to make better use of the tensor cores. Um, Kate Clark also just started a Slack channel and Mixed Precision, so you're welcome to join that. Um, there are a number of libraries and frameworks that you could try. Um, you could sort of make it easier to try reduced precision with the same higher precision interfaces. Um, some in the DL frameworks, people have been working this with something we have called AMP, where you can just throw a switch and lo and behold, you get a whole lot more performance. Um, we have some an iterative refinement uh, in the Q solver, as you were referring to, Sherry. Um, we've done this with the CUDA that's used for Chroma and other apps with Kublas and QTensor, where you can sort of drop in for the mixed precision. Um, and I expect we can come back to this perhaps um, in the broader discussion, but uh, I kind of wanted to offer some different highlights of some opportunities with iterative solvers, multi-level summation, or figuring out, you know, hey, where am I actually only concerned about a particular physical patch? And I don't really have to look outside that. That often can give you um, an aid in both the, the range and the precision you need. Maybe for something like drug discovery or free energy, um, I care more a lot about sort of getting close and processing lots of samples to figure out where I should care rather than getting super accurate results. Um, we've had some discussions about where physicists know, hey, you really need to care about water and or this virus has a particular molecule, but it's kind of inert. You have to include it in your model, but it really don't need to worry that much about what's going on that. So treat that with lower precision. Um, than something else that's really operative. So maybe we need some sort of a new forum, I don't know, for being able to have more communication there. Um, being able to analyze, you know, what is the science? What are the physical limits? Uh, how can you work through these subsets of species that you should care about versus not? What matters in the algorithm? Uh, how sensitive am I to variation across the data sets if I'm trying to uh, use profiling, for example, um, as uh, uh, Hugo has done uh, with the tool that we mentioned there. 
um, to be able to analyze those intersets. Um, what kind of interfaces do we need? Um, and how do you automate this? How do I, uh, uh, you know, measure the stability in terms of the number of iterations or does it converge? And I introduce some noise tolerance or measure the noise tolerance by introducing some noise um, and looking at across the year validation data sets. And do we work up a set of like, hey, here are the different interfaces for these different operations at different precisions for these different SKUs or generational models so that developers kind of know what's at their fingertips to be able to work with. So Sorry. these are some Sorry. ideas we've been working with. CJ, just could you wind up in uh, less than one minute? Thank you. How about negative five seconds? So I'm done. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, CJ. Yeah, thank you. So uh, our next uh, speaker <clears throat> is uh, Cindy Rubio Gonzalez. Cindy uh, is an associate professor of computer science at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Rubio Rocks <coughs> spans the areas of programming languages and software engineering with a focus on program analysis for automated bug finding and program optimization. She is particularly interested in the reliability and performance of system software and scientific applications. Now for dynamic analysis for floating point precision tuning, Cindy Rubio Gonzalez. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so let me. Yeah. So and thank you to to the introductions before. Uh, also, it's not hard to um, you know convince everyone that floating point arithmetic is used everywhere. Uh, but unfortunately, reasoning about floating point programs is often difficult given the large variety of numerical problems that can exist in these programs and also the fact that most programmers are not experts in floating point. Because of this, a common practice is to use the highest available precision, which often leads to poor performance. So the goal of our work is to develop automated techniques to assist programmers in tuning the precision of their floating point programs. So the idea is to systematically search over the types of floating point variables to recommend a type configuration that specifies what type to use for each variable declaration. The goal here is that the resulting program should still produce an acceptable answer while being faster than the original program. So um, let me just illustrate um, our program transformations using an example. So here is an excerpt of a C program that computes the at length of a function G so I will not go into the details, but um, I want to just um, point out that this program uses long double precision. And here we have been told that by, by an expert that there is a mixed precision program that produces an answer as accurate as the original program while being faster. And here is the program. So um, the overall structure is unchanged aside from some variable declarations and function calls. Um, so here, for example, variable S1 is an accumulator, so it remains in long double to avoid accuracy loss. However, the precision of the remaining variables has been lower to either double or float. Furthermore, uh, the call to this square root function has been replaced with a call to the corresponding single precision implementation as square root F. So unfortunately, even for small programs like these, it is infeasible to find these type configurations by hand. So our goal is to automatically find them so that programmers can use them as a start point to explore opportunities for optimization. And one of such efforts, our first effort uh, was the tool Presimonios, um, which is a dynamic analysis for precision tuning that takes as to input the source code that you would like to tune along with an error threshold and also a set of inputs. And what Persimonius does is that it lists the floating point variables in the program and it performs a binary-like search to find a type configuration so that the, pro the resulting program still computes an accurate result with respect to the error threshold while being faster. Now, some, um, some of the advantages of Persimonius is that it considers both accuracy and performance, and because it's black box, it works on medium-sized non-trivial programs. It is easily, easily configurable because you can specify what areas of the program to focus on if you know them, 
And also in our initial evaluations, it gave speed ups of up to 40%. Now, the downside of this technique is that it, um, it explores multiple configurations during the search, and each of them has to be evaluated. And that is because simply lowering precision does not mean that the program will be faster. Now, also precimonious only explores a subset of the search space, so the ordering of the variables will, will affect what parts of the search space are uh, looked at. Now, in order to add some of these challenges, we also develop another couple of tools. One of them is blame analysis, which performs shadow execution and it only requires one single run of the program. And this is to identify variables that can be allocated in single precision. Now, because it only runs the program once, it only focuses on accuracy, not in performance. And also, unfortunately, shadow execution has its own overhead. Now, the best setting that we found was combining blame analysis to prune the search space and then running precimonials on top of it to find a configuration that speeds up the program. And this resulted in a considerably faster analysis. Now, these two techniques are still black box, which means that we cannot leverage what the program is actually doing. And then uh, we work on HP Tuner, which is a white box hierarchical approach that groups variables based on their usage so that we only consider type configurations that can actually lead to a speed up because they will focus on configurations that do not have many cast operations. And uh, this still requires program profiling to find dependencies among variables, but this resulted in a considerably faster uh, search and also finding configurations that led to higher speed ups. Now, to conclude, I would like to um, briefly list a couple of questions that we, we can discuss during the panel. So in terms of how we can apply these techniques to uh, HPC applications. So despite all the um, disadvantages I, I briefly discussed, the tools I, I presented, um, they are the state of the art in dynamic, uh, dynamic, dynamic precision tuning, and, um, and, but there are still challenges to overcome. So for example, these type configurations that the tools propose rely on the inputs that we use during the tuning process. So is this a problem for HPC applications or um, is there any other correctness metrics that the applications use that we could leverage in order to, to make these configurations, to make you know, more general guarantees about these configurations? Also, these current approaches do not scale for long running applications, applications that need to run for hours, days, or weeks. So we need to further find ways to reduce the search space or find incremental ways to apply these uh, techniques. Um, third is that even though these configurations are leading to a speed up, we do not know how far we are from the ideal configuration that we could find. So are there any other program transformations that we could explore in addition to changing variable declarations and function calls? Or is there any domain knowledge in the HPC application that we want to tune that we can use to guide the search? That would be very helpful to figure out. And finally, as a tool developer, one of the blocks that I have always found is um, applications to, to test these precision tuners. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity to connect to application developers in order to get a collaboration to, um, you know, to put together a collection of applications that we could use in order to have um, further inspiration and find the bottlenecks for these tools. So I would just like to acknowledge my, the collaborators for the tools I mentioned from Berkeley, LVNL, Oracle, and Davis. And I would like to conclude by, by uh, listing here um, the links to all the tools that I mentioned. So all of them are open source. Um, as I said, we're actively look, working on these tools. So it would be great to connect to uh, developers who have access to HPC applications that could benefit from tuning. And also I would like to make a quick announcement about a workshop that I am co-organizing with Ignacio Laguna um, from Livermore 
uh, at supercomputing. So if you have, if you are working on, you know, topics related to mixed precision and correctness, uh, so we welcome your submissions. And yeah, so. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, yeah, that was a nice view of uh, all the tool for searching the space of uh, type configurations. And I think this is complementary of what we've seen before, that were um, more in-depth uh, mixed precision tuning of a specific library, which are broadly used, like sparse LU. So do we have any question from the audience? You can raise your hand or ask a question in the Q&A. Okay, I have a, a question for, for Sherry. Uh, <clears throat> what were your biggest challenges that you faced when reducing precision of a sparse linear solver? <clears throat> uh, the biggest uh, challenge? Yeah, in terms of uh, getting the solver to converge and uh, getting performance. Uh, yes, so, so the, uh, the, the code is uh, very complicated. So it's, uh, you know, we started with the double precision code, double precision and double complex, and we have a automatic uh, macro to uh, macronize the, uh, the code base to generate a single precision code. But, uh, you know, the compared to dense code, there is just a, a lot more uh, different pieces going on, not, not related. To, a lot of these like a scatter gather operation, they are not related to the uh, floating point operation. So you need to take care of all these uh, indirect uh, addressing mode correctly. So mm -hmm. that's, a, you know, it's a quite an engineering, a lot of these engineering part, it's, uh, it doesn't show up in a dense code. Okay, so yeah, these are problems specific to the sparse, uh, sparse linear algebra. Um, and numerically, there is no difference in terms of uh, error analysis uh, compared to the dense case. So, so in the dense case, we already know very well, we have uh, proved everything. So that's why numerically, I don't worry. But performance-wise, how much we can gain is uh, very limited. We can gain some, but uh, I think it's uh, limited. Okay, and we, we have seen like a presentation of, um, for example, CJ, you, you talked during the, the work group that uh, there has been a lot of uh, research on optimizing specific libraries. Um, do you think, all, all, all of you, all the three panelists, do you think this is the, the path to, to make mixed precision into uh, general applications is to tune specific libraries? Or, or can we leverage some, like uh, Cindy said, some metrics from specific application to apply it to general case, general purpose? In, in other terms, how can we bridge the gap between uh, specific library optimization with mixed precision tuning and having a, a recipe that could be applied to any application. So, if, I guess so. yeah, CJ, go ahead. Our experience in general has been, uh, you know, kind of following the, the bang for the buck, right? So if you're going to make an investment, finding something that is common to lots of users that you're solving lots and lots of people's end-to-end -end problem, um, then you know, going after that in library form first, uh, you're, it's easier to justify a larger person power investment in really making that one thing shine. Um, and while you're doing that, you're likely to learn a bunch of things. And so then you can apply that either to the next library or to document and share some of those learnings so that it can be applied in other cases by sort of end developers. But, you know, kind of uh, leveraging the scale principle in the community uh, seems like a good place to start. Yep. 
um, that was, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was just going to add that I completely okay. agree that, uh, you know, tuning uh, the, the, the lower, lower end blocks is, uh, you know, a first step. I also think that there will be optimization. So there will be optimizations that are specific to applications um, that we can always leverage. But also that makes it even more complicated because um, often they are not general, so they are very specific, uh, application specific. So I think that maybe going the way of developing tools that can easily um, take advantage of that domain knowledge will be the way to go so that we, we are able to take advantage of what we know about an, an application to get the best performance, but also being able to perhaps apply it to in other scenarios that we don't know about yet. Yeah, and maybe it will yeah. help uh, building this domain knowledge. Go ahead. Yeah, just to really, just to really plus one that Cindy, um, being able to, DSLs can really be your friend, right? So where, again, there's a broad applicability within a given domain, and if you can use a DSL, as many people there at Berkeley and other places have done, and uh, focus there first, where you're dealing with a, a set of constraints that you can operate with, um, can be very fruitful. We have a question here from uh, Jack. A lot of the current hardware emphasis advantage uh, low precision appears to be driven by machine learning applications. Do you see these trends continuing? Sh should we continue to expect possible super linear speed up for lowering precision? I'm happy to respond to that, but can others go first if they want? Uh, no, go ahead, CJ. All right. So I think it's interesting if you look at what we did in this case, we went for FP16 first and uh, then sort of uh, backed out to higher precisions so that we could, uh, where the lower precisions was good enough for a lot of DL. And then we backed off to higher precisions which are really needed for a lot of HPC. And we kind of compromised with the, the TF32 um, I, I actually skipped a slide uh, as I was uh, talking about that, of where um, uh, you can sort of use the 8 bit range um, uh, for. Actually, is it okay if I share that? I don't know if it is. Yeah, I can just put that up. Um, using um, kind of a uh, the best of both worlds of uh, being able to uh, get that. Uh, I can't talk in. Um, at this at the same time very well. Um, yeah. Here, there we go. Are you sure? I, oh yeah, sure. There. Um, so in this one, uh, sort of, it, it, different things help uh, in different ways. So we, we found that going back up to um, being able to uh, do things at higher precision was helpful. Uh, finding a compromise where with the TF32 tensor cores, you can get uh, an 8-bit range like FP32 and B-float, um, but 10-bit precision like the FP16 um, was very fruitful. Um, we also see opportunities, uh, as I've mentioned also, uh, with the um, uh, single bit, all right, there was some Gordon Bell work in 2018 that uh, did really well with sort of one bit stuff and sort of an adjacency to HPC with the signal processing of eight bits for radio astronomy. So uh, we do think that there are, are opportunities up and down that, and I think we need to explore that whole range. So uh, going, sorting in the middle and going up and down from there it seems fruitful. Thank you, CJ. Uh, Cindy, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add like the aspect of correctness in here, because um, yes, I agree. Well, we have seen that, you know, there is this this trend from ML to, to push for, for mixed precision, but also I believe that ML applications have very different um, requirements in terms of correctness. And that's something that usually comes up in all these automated tools that we need to know what what correctness means and then these tools are um, 
driven by a subset of inputs. So how, how much error are we willing to tolerate? So that's something that we need to, to have on the table because even though you know, we can put ML applications and scientific applications together in terms of performance, um, I think in terms of correctness, they, they may be very different. Yeah, that is, that is true. The correctness uh, criteria is sometimes very difficult to, to get uh, from the application developers. It's a, it's a full problem. So we, we have a question here. Uh, I will ask it to, uh, to Sherry. Do we need mixed precision because of convergence of HPC with AI workloads or because either HPC or AI workloads are more thirsty for performance that, than we currently can deliver? And I would reformulate this question also saying that, um, yeah, um, what, what did you push, what pushed you to, uh, to use mixed precision in sparse LU? <clears throat> yeah, so for, for us, the motivation is really to uh, reduce the communication. So if we can use a lower precision, we have a memory access will be smaller and the communication will be reduced by half. So that's the uh, real motivation. And uh, if you are talking about uh, HPC AI together, and I think uh, the uh, the TF32, uh, this uh, format is really attractive because uh, it doesn't uh, you know, reduce the range, which is really needed for most of the uh, HPC applications. If you have only five bit uh, exponent, it's really limited. We cannot, very often you can do some trick like uh, balance the matrix equilibration. But in most cases, uh, those techniques is not helpful. So five bit is too limited. And then you reduce the, uh, just uh, reduce the uh, uh, Mantisa to do things uh, faster, but keeping the same range. I think that's a very good uh, compromise in both worlds. And also the, for this uh, TF32, the application code that you float, you don't need to change the, it's not a different data type, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's also convenient for, for, the, uh, for the application people. Yeah, we're, we're seeing uh, more and more hardware uh, floating points um, way to return the floating point like uh, the fixed or TF32 to be maybe driven by applications needs. Uh, do you think there will be uh, <clears throat> more needs for, for, for this, for this specific type of uh, floating point? Uh, and do you think the hardware will answer to them like it did with the AI? AI. Uh, so maybe CJ can answer this, but I, my impression is the, uh, with this, for example, this uh, TF32, and there's already tensor cores for this uh, format, which is uh, sped up, speed up things uh, dramatically, right? Right. I think that that would be very useful, yeah. It, and, and maybe just to take that in a slightly different direction and coming back to uh, Florina's question, uh, one of the things that we're seeing, and I'll, I'll just cite HPC at the edge as an example of where uh, I, I visited some people at some government labs where it's really important uh, to make best use of the a very, very expensive equipment uh, for being able to you know, take measurements, whether it's um, microscopy or whatever it might be. And it's very easy to uh, get uh, a completely bad data because you didn't set it up right. It's also possible to sort of take only a few samples of something that was really interesting and surprising, but you didn't discover that until much later it was sent back to the scientist and uh, they said, oh man, that, that was really cool. Please, please do this experiment all over again. There are a lot of folks that are telling us, we really want to be able to get a very quick turnaround and get almost instantaneous feedback from this. So what that means is that we're, if you will, downloading a model uh, that we use for inference into um, the instrumentation pipeline. 
We're also doing other kinds of HPC processing. We might be bringing in video and doing feature extraction and so on. So one of the connections here is that having the same hardware that's both really good at HPC and really good at AI um, and being able to have that at any scale where you can do it out in uh, sort of smaller instruments that are out near the edge. Maybe it's in at a base tower so that you're looking for a lost person or whatever and you, you push out something that's really good at recognizing that person wearing a red jacket or something. Or you can move it back into uh, the data center and being able to make that trade-off in the same kind of programming model that's able to run on the same kinds of hardware that may be just available at different scale, that's pretty cool. Um, and being able to have that sort of model uh, that's there um, wherever it's needed throughout your whole system kind of opens up a lot of opportunities. So that, that's maybe um, a different perspective. Hmm. Thank you, CJ, for, for this. Yeah, um, Yeah. the, the question I, I, I just asked to, uh, to Sherry, uh, I think uh, both of you can also uh, give your, your point of view um, about the, the convergence uh, HPC AI and the uh, the why we are using mixed precision. Uh, Cindy, do you want to, to give your point of view on this? Um, yes, so um, it's, uh, sorry, sorry, is this about also Florina's question, right? That what is driving the, the, the need for mixed precision, yeah. correct? Okay, yeah. um, so from my point of view, developing these tools, um, it seems like the main driven force has been per performance. Um, and then by low, by using mixed precision, then we have to be aware about any additional numerical problems that this might bring. So it's not so much about, um, uh, you know, doing the mixed precision because of the need of the convergence, but it's mostly about achieving as much performance speed ups as we can, and then being aware of what other problems are being introduced because of that. Thank you. So I think we have a, a complete uh, view on, on, on this on this problem. And yeah, thanks CJ for this uh, dynamically mixed precision model that <laughs> it looks like a, yeah. And um, so do we have another question from the public? Okay, so yeah. Uh, we, we will finish soon. Mm -mm. You can, uh, if you have a, a last um, question or debate you, you want to uh, to bring bring up uh, between you, otherwise uh, I have uh, one more question I would like to ask. So, yeah, it, this is um, a bit specific to, um, to Sherry application. You say that uh, this is bound with bound because it's a sparse linear algebra. And you say mix, mixing precision will help you to reduce the data movements. So we're talking about, about a, a lot about making computation go faster with tensor cores on NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. But actually for such application, tensor cores are maybe not the, the solution because of the bound with bound aspect. Have you considered uh, using MPI communication with reduced precision data? Uh, yeah, yes, so for, uh, for in the single precision code, uh, I was uh, uh, showing the results. So that's the, using the MPI uh, float to do communication. Okay. But um, I'm not sure whether, you know, you're asking even with uh, even more reduced uh, communication, uh, reduced. Yeah, the, maybe tricks with uh, uh, compressing the data or Yes, so so that's a, that's a very good question. So for the compression, you know, there are some tools. Uh, like for example, Livermore has this tool called I think a ZFP compressor or something. And uh, the we we don't know yet. Uh, we haven't uh, experimented the uh, the impact on the final result. I mean that that's a very good direction to go. I think. You know, you compress your data before you do the communication. Yeah. So yeah, that seems like a, a good uh, axis of, of research. Yeah. Uh, another axis of research, uh, getting back to what Cindy said, what about the the correctness of like how to 
to define the correctness criteria from some application. I mean, for some of them it's quite obvious uh, when you have just the significant digits of the, of the results and you have your solver which must converge with such a, a significant digits. For some of them it's a bit less obvious. And maybe uh, people can join the NERSC user uh, Slack channel and um, on the mixed precision channel and, and we can talk about it further. So for this, I will uh, thank you all the, the, the panelists. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for, for these mm, discussions. Um, I want to tell to the audience that uh, we will have a, a last talk at the end of the day, uh, wrapping up the, the GPU for Science two days. And, um, and we will uh, share with you uh, a form to ask you what you think about this uh, these two, two days. Again, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, CJ, Cindy, and Sherry for for this uh, instructive panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity.